Islamic extremism is the most intolerant ideology in the world today. And it's one which a lot of people think they have to tolerate, because if they don't, they themselves will be regarded as intolerant. I think that's not just stupid. In the final analysis, it's suicidal. Islam, when it is in a minority, is extremely good at talking about tolerance. In a minority, Islam loves to talk about the tolerance that people must show towards minorities. One of the things, however, if you look around the world, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, is that whenever Islam is in a majority, minority rights are nowhere to be seen. It's a one-directional talk of minority rights. When Islam is in a minority, it talks of the importance of human rights. Uh, when it is in a majority, those human rights, including the most basic human rights, like the rights of women to be considered equal beings, uh, are thrown right out the window. Uh, there are all of the problems of the world, all the problems of the jihad, all the problems of violence come down to us. It's all to do with Iraq war, it's all to do with Afghanistan. You've heard it a million times, it is not new stuff. But I would stress to you that if that argument were true, take it seriously for a moment, and we should, if that argument were true, it doesn't explain quite a lot of things. In other words, as well as being in a fundamental way, I believe, racist, i.e. the people who are doing the acts are not responsible. They don't even have culpability. They can't even make choices. They can't even screw up unless it's our fault. <laughs> now, apart from that, it is also simply historically inept. If it is our fault, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps Mr. Cooper or Mr. Lewis could, could, could answer this, if all of the problems of the jihad are our fault, why are currently, and have been for a long time, Muslims slaughtering Hindus in India? Why are, why are they slaughtering, and have been for a long time, Buddhists in Indonesia and Thailand? Why are they murdering animists in South Sudan? Is that sort of a war? Are we going to relay that one at the fascist Junker of Bush and Blair as well? <laughs> this gentleman there, about, you know, going to the protest of the Pope rally. If I may say so, this, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't there, I didn't approve of the protest because there were various things around it I think are complete guff. One of them is the fact that people love saying they went to the protest of the Pope thing. I, you know, the, the, the Pope, you know, the, 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 the sort of, you know, Pope's not, not, not on board with gay marriage. You know, I'm a gay man, I'd love to have gay marriage uh, uh, approved by the Catholic Church. But, you know, they're not going to. Meantime, I really, really wish that people would reserve their eye for the people who don't just want to stop me marrying, but want to throw me off a cliff. Much much better way to spend your time but of course people love it because they think oh i'll attack the islamists but then to be allowing allow myself to do that i can attack the pope to show i'm not a racist show me a monsignor grab me a cardinal and i and i can attack them because that will allow me this is left-wing nonsense well um i'd first of all say absolutely not to do with our actions abroad but put that in with one rider if it were the case that because of our foreign policy people think they have the right to blow up people going to nightclubs and to blow up those fleeing from the first blast, as seems to be the case, then I say you have a choice in front of you, much like the choice we had a few weeks ago over whether or not Britain and the British state has the right to decide who gets knighthoods or whether crowds in Pakistan who burn books they can't read have that right. And we have the same choice now which is whether or not British foreign policy will be run by the British government in the interests of the British state, which I think is the case, or whether or not we just allow other people who let off bombs here or in Baghdad or anyone else who want to terrorize us, whether we allow them to run our foreign policy. That's the choice before us. So what's your answer to the question? The cause the of the terror? The answer is that the cause of the terror is Islamist fundamentalism, which is a version of Islam, a politicized version of Islam, which is wreaking havoc across the globe and has been doing so for many years, and which was aiming to uh, attack this country and our allies before the invasion of Iraq, before the invasion of Afghanistan, and indeed even before 9-11. Are we too critical of Israel? Uh, the country would get this crowd out tonight if we had it in the title. Syrian government just within, just hours ago sent its own troops in a massacre of people in a mosque in Syrian territory. But would we have, would you have a, a, a motion here? Well, Holloway have got you all out on a pleasant Wednesday evening. Are we too critical of Syria? No. No, I'm very sure we wouldn't. Saudi government's just been pimping out its own troops to the government of Bahrain.
gunned down the people of Bahrain, Bahrain streets. Would you come out to discuss, are we too critical of Bahrain? Are we too critical of Saudi? No. Because international efforts led by propagandists at the moment seek only to demonize one nation in the world, and that nation is Israel. Uh, the wider Middle East has uh, very significant problems, quite enough problems of its own. People talk about the Middle East as if it were just this issue. It's really quite low-level conflict, as if it isn't all of the other issues in the region, not least the issue of Iran sponsoring terror groups and, uh, and, and breaking all international obligations in its pursuit of nuclear weaponry. Uh, the, uh, the problem for Mr. Obama is considerable and hasn't been made any easier by the Nobel Prize Award. I, I, I was uh, in Rome last Friday and I heard the news. I just got off a plane and, and I have to say I thought I must have got sunstroke when somebody told me about it. Uh, I don't think the Nobel Prizes mean very much. Certainly they haven't uh, for peace ever since Yasser Arafat won one and indeed since Henry Kissinger won one. Um, Nobel Prizes for Literature have meant even less since uh, Dario Fo and Harold Pinter won them. So, um, uh, Barack Obama, is Barack the, Obama, the by the way, is going to help him. No, it's going to make it. It's going to make life nightmarish for him. I mean, uh, b b awarding a, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize to Barack Obama is like giving the Nobel Prize for Literature to a person who has yet to write their first book. Um, he hasn't done anything, but the expectations now are monstrous. Could we talk a little bit about democracy? Um, and what the democratic society is. Um, I agree with my predecessor here that the uh, rule of law here is central and equality before the rule of law and indeed quality generally. Uh, equality generally. Um, in Britain at the moment we have a very worrying development with uh, the introduction recently of a parallel system of banking, of Sharia banking, which the Financial Times recently wrote an extraordinarily dry and supine supplement all about. Um, <laughs> The, uh, it, uh, the uh, attempts uh, to influence the British government into introducing Sharia law uh, is another one. Now, I don't think uh, that this should be hard to counter because the thing you do to counter it is quite attractive to most people, which is to say that equality is not something you're going to give up and it's not something you're going to not share around a bit. And equality means that if I go into a bank, I get the same loan as a Muslim does when they go into a bank, and the same kind of mortgage. And that if I go before the courts of Great Britain, I will be treated in exactly the same way as a girl who's an immigrant who's been in the country for a year, who might have a different set of beliefs from me, but lives in the same country under the same law. And I think that's an attractive proposition and something which a democratic state will always have on its side. No, he wasn't right. Um, the facts of this case are complex at the moment um, because of the complex nature of the legal entanglement into which this country has got itself. Um, I would just put it this way. The uh, uh, Commission decided these two men uh, were actively involved with Al-Qaeda. The security services cannot, they say, deliver this evidence in open court. It was delivered in closed session there. Um, and so we're in a bind. And I just put it as follows. We're in a bind because we apparently cannot extradite these two young men, Pakistani nationals, who are wanting to harm, we're told, are wanting to harm people in this country. We're not able to extradite them to Pakistan, their own country, in case they are tortured there. I would just put it this way. Uh, we are now going to have to pay for two Al-Qaeda associates to stay in this country to protect their human rights, defending their rights, I believe, over the rights of the people of this country. I think you have to look at this perfectly plainly, and I would say you can't put it any stronger than this. Any society that wanted to survive would not behave like this, would not defend their enemies over their own people, would not protect their enemies better than they protect their own people. But it would send no them away regardless, would send them away regardless. regardless of what happened. And if, if the new Home Secretary uh, has uh, any sense about this, and I very much hope she has, she will realize that no government that wants to survive would behave like All this. Right. It is preposterous to, to do that. I wish that uh, Zebra and Majid uh, were the spokespeople of Islam. It would be lovely, although in Majid's case it would have taken rather too long if everyone had to go for 14 years preaching the downfall of America and then said, no, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we, well, we are where we are. Uh, anyhow, I wish they spoke for Islam. It would be great. Uh, but the fact is that tonight, the organizers of this debate asked a number of clerics. None of them would show. Specifically, they wouldn't show and debate against Ayan Hirsi Ali. Um, myself, I don't think they cared. But, um, 
but, uh, but, uh, but no, it's very interesting that. They will not debate time and again. Muslim, the actual leaders of your religion will not debate this. And you're left with people like we have here. The reason why is, of course, is that the leaders of the religion show such terrible, uh, uh, terrible lessons. Uh, it is not a small thing. It's not as it were a detail. It's not like a wacky Florida pastor that you've got the largest Sunni state of Saudi Arabia, the most important Sunni state in the world, the most extraordinary closed prison of a society. It's not, it's not a detail, it's not a, a one-off nut job that the Shiite Republic of Iran is what it is, led by the people it's led by. That is not an accident, it's not a detail. The thing that worries me is that although tonight we hear from the fellow panelists here about how Islam is a religion of peace. The fact is that the people who are making the decisions in the religion, the people who are preaching in the religion, the heads of that religion, people like Sheikh Haradawi who broadcasts anti-Semitic, the most appalling filth every week on the main networks, that is the, the, the faith that is the, the, the speaking for you guys. I wish that, Zeba, you were on every uh, week on Al Jazeera, but you're not. Karadawi is. Multiculturalism in the way it's practiced has been a disaster. It's been a profound disaster. The rule of law of the British state is not up for negotiation. The rule of law across the West and West conditions are not up for negotiation. And if you think that multiculturalism is something which somehow is going to be a universal world civilization, I would ask you simple questions. How's multiculturalism going in Saudi Arabia right now? Why is building a synagogue or even praying for the non-Muslim God? in Saudi Arabia, or across many countries in that region. It doesn't happen, i.e. there's no reciprocity. On the other hand, here, just a few months ago, Justice Minister of the Netherlands, Piet Hein Donner, announced that when a majority of people wanted it, he was willing to institute Sharia law across the Netherlands. Now, on current demographics, that majority isn't too far away. What will the Netherlands look like when that happens? What will this country look like if people in this country go along with that idea as well? The point is that there is an answer to this. We keep the moderates and encourage the moderates to be on our side and to believe in the rule of law and the strength of the state. But the state at the moment here and in the West is not looking strong. It is looking weak. It is looking weak because leaders and others like the mayor of London claim and are seen to be claiming across the world that this is our fault, that this is our problem. I say we should be giving up another side, which is to say to people, this is a city with people of all different faiths, all different nationalities, and that is fine, but there are norms which you agree to. We are not giving out that message. We should be saying clearly, the Mayor of London should be saying far more clearly and far more regularly, there are some things that are not open for negotiation. You will not have Sharia, there are countries you could have it, sadly, but this will not be one of them. Multiculturalism is not about equality, it is about treating people absolutely differently. It's saying if you have a tribal norm in your area, we will make you obey that, or allow you to continue obeying that. Well, we know where that leads. It led, among other th things, to the stoning of Goffrin Hadoui in Marseille in 2004, for breaking no law of the French state, but just uh, refusing the advances of a young Muslim man in her area. Um, that's where we end up. This is a fundamental problem, and it's one we're going to have to deal with. It's a problem between a society, Western Europe, that believes that laws are based on reason, and Islam that believes that they are based on revelation. Between these two ideas, I'm not sure there is very much compromise for Europe. It is not Europe that has let down its Muslims, but the Muslims of Europe that have let down Europe. This is not solely something which we have to say we can never reconcile. Of course we can reconcile this, but we need to be honest about it. We need to be frank about it, and we cannot avoid things just because they are unpleasant. And if there were one thing I would wish Muslims in Europe could learn today, as fast as possible, it would be this, that you have no right in this society not to be offended. You have no right to say that because you don't like something you can commit violence or you would like something to be stopped or censored, you have no right to have more hate laws or hate crime laws or hate speech laws just to defend Islam. You have to realize, the Muslims of Europe have to realize that a society in which even your deepest feelings can be trodden upon is the only society worth living in. And the sooner we can learn that, the sooner that Islam can learn that within Europe, the better. It is not Europe that has failed its Muslims. It is Islam that has failed Europe. I'd argue 
Islam has failed its Muslims. Thank you.